Welcome to the day three of the June 2023 convening. My task is to introduce Professor Lumumba and moderate the Q&A when time allows it for that. Um, Professor Lumumba as a true ardent, erudite, and dynamic Pan-Africanist or Pan-Africanism ideologue doesn't really require much introduction. But the essential thing is that this plenary session is under the title Exploring the Significance of Pan-Africanism and Cultivating Leadership Within African Higher Education Institutions. So given that it doesn't require much introduction, I will greatly welcome him to deliver the keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for that very brief and apt introduction. I'm an opponent of long introductions because nobody actually remembers what is read. <laughs> but let me say first how glad I am to have been invited to be present in this august assembly. It is not lost on me that you have senior academics drawn from different institutions across the continent of Africa quite a number of whom are known to me, who are running institutions at the highest level and are senior academics. I'm also aware that there are junior academics who are rising through the ranks. And I am humbled to be invited to share my thoughts with you on what I consider to be very significant, particularly at this stage in the history of Africa. And in order to contextualize my conversation, I will deliver no lecture, because I believe that conversations are a lot more enriching, a lot more realistic, because some of the things I'll be speaking about and speaking to are things that are known to you. And what I'll be doing is possibly to speak about them from a different perspective. When one talks about Pan-Africanism, particularly today, uh, there is uh, the tendency from the one side to romanticize Pan-Africanism, to articulate Pan-Africanism as if it were a magic wand, which, when waved, will solve all African problems, whether they are technological, commercial, political, or otherwise. Then, from another perspective, there, there, there are those who think that Pan-Africanism is merely a curiosity, one that we take refuge in, in order to massage our egos without more. But Pan-Africanism is serious business. It is serious business because it helps to give us a worldview of what we can do in order to give Africa and Africans a sense of direction and a sense of esteem. And Pan-Africanism must be traced to its origins. And of course, one will not go to the period prior to the interaction between Africa and other civilizations. But there was some element of Pan-Africanism. And those of you who are familiar with the works of Chekante Diop will be familiar with this very able articulation of the state of Africa before the advent of the colonizers, before the advent of slavery, classical slavery as we know it. But we must, in the nature of things, have what I call a historical cut-off point, particularly when we want to contextualize our discourse in the arena of education generally and higher education specifically. 
you will be familiar with the very early ideas of uh, the great uh, Sylvester Williams of Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean when the whole idea of Pan-Africanism was gaining traction in the middle part of the 19th century. Fundamentally, as a reaction uh, to the manner in which the African had been treated during slavery and the manner in which the African was being treated during colonization. And in its very embryonic stages, one begins to hear Africans talking about education as they understood it then as one of the key avenues via, via which liberation understood broadly could be achieved. That ignorance was not bliss. You wanted to create an army of young men and women whose world view was informed in a particular direction, the direction of liberating Africans whether they were in the mother continent, in the continent of Africa, or they were in the diaspora in the Caribbean, or in Latin America, or Europe, or Australia. And you will see the series of meetings that are then held during that period. And specifically, they are iconic interactions because when the colonizer came into the continent of Africa, education was informed by the colonizer. So that if you went to the former Portuguese colonies, there was a very deliberate effort on the part of the Portuguese to recruit a cadre of individuals who would then be taken to Lisbon to be trained and to go back, whether it was Guinea-Bissau, or to Angola, or Cabo de Verde, or to Mozambique, or to Brazil, in order to serve the colonial infrastructure. And there were very few recruited in that regard. And when one is talking about education in many countries, one can actually identify them, because they then became political leaders in their various countries and were involved in establishing educational institutions. You can talk about Agostino Neto in Angola, and you will read his poems to understand how great a mind he was. You will talk about uh, Amilcar Cabral in, in Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde. You will talk about Eduardo Mondlane in, in Mozambique. And you can, then you come to the former French colonies, the same. And there are people from La Côte d'Ivoire here. You'll know that institutions such as the Sorbonne had specific faculties that were created for the purpose of recruiting young Africans, people like Leopold Sedar Senghor in Senegal, Felix Soufé Boigny. And these were individuals who were specifically identified and picked to go for what was fundamentally indoctrination. And of course, the British also did the same thing. And that is how you then understand how they were picked, whether you are talking about uh, in, 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 in countries such as Zambia, they would pick people like Kenneth David Kaunda in Malawi, Kamuzu Hastings Banda in Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, in Tanzania, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, and one would go on and on. And even if you went to the apartheid regimes in South Africa, you'll find that individuals such as Nelson Mandela were directed towards Fort Hare. And Fort Hare was deliberately designed to train young people in order to support what was fundamentally uh, a legal regime and a political regime that was, not, was meant to perpetuate itself. If you go to Namibia, and I'm mentioning these individuals because later they become the leaders who are involved in dealing with education in Africa. You go to Namibia, Sam Lioma did not go to school very much, but he had his stint, and Imba Toivo, Toivo, Ya Toivo, and one can count all of them. So that 
the Africa that you are talking about and the education that you are talking about is an education system that was designed to undergird the colonial system. Recently, I went to Zanzibar and a young man was taking me through the stone town of Zanzibar and he had a most amazing interpretation. He told me, this is one of the schools that they built in order to teach Africans to think like them. Then this is one of the churches that they created so that they could teach the Africans to worship like them and to paralyze their spirituality. And this is one of the hospitals where they treated them when they were sick so that they could serve them. I thought that was ingenious. It was a correct interpretation so that whenever the African was educated, it was not by design that you should help your fellow Africans. That was coincidental. You are simply an agent and a vessel for purposes of ensuring that you serve the colonial masters. The French and the Portuguese were more blatant. And the good professor from La Côte d'Ivoire will tell you that when they took people to the parades, one of the things they would do for the Africans to say, our ancestors, the girls. An African saying that their ancestors were the girls. And it is in that context that therefore you must understand when we are talking about the establishment of education facilities across the continent of Africa, Universities were informed by that. Whether it was the University of, uh, of East Africa with campuses in Kampala, Makerere for medicine, the Royal Technical College in Nairobi for engineering, the University of Dar es Salaam for law, and if you came here in uh, in, in Ghana, when they established the Achimota College, and I want you to look at, at the founding instruments of Achimota and why they established Achimota, and they were doing that in King's College Budo in Uganda and later in Kisubi. The whole idea was to create an African man and woman who was fundamentally an automaton designed to serve the master, designed to serve the puppeteer, he or she was meant to be, an, uh, to be a puppet. You know, this debate begins to crystallize a lot more visibly in the United States when you are talking about Pan-Africanism. Because the United States is grappling the white, the, 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 the black man has been released from uh, slavery. They have been be told that they would get 40 acres and one mule, which they never receive. They have recruited the Uncle Toms. And they are persuading the black people at that time that what you need are a set of skills. Be a good plumber. Be a good electrician. And in the United States, you begin to see a battle and two streams. Buka Taliaferro, Washington, whom you will remember, and his college in Tuskegee in Alabama, who says the Negro must go to this education institution in order to be trained to have a set of skills, to conform. But there is another stream of W.E.B. Du Bois, who says... Education must be revolutionary. It must change your mind. It must change your thinking. We must think differently. If they have Harvard, we must have Howard. We must think differently. And at that time, a young South African is also visiting and learning in the United States of America. People never talk about him as much as they should. Pixley Kaisaka Seme. Many people don't know, but there is a book written about him as the founder of the African National Congress. Pixley Kaisaka Seme is then a student at the University of Columbia, and he delivers one of the most 
iconic speeches ever delivered by an African in the month of April 1906, the regeneration of Africa. And I commend it to you. He says at that time, and I paraphrase rather than quote Pixley Kaisa Kassem, that Africa must rise again. It must rise from the morass of confusion in which she finds herself. And it is not lost on me that Pixley delivers that lecture in the year 1906. And in 1912, the African National Congress is then founded in South Africa with Pixley Kaisa Kaseme and Sir Albert Lutuli as some of the leading lights and, of course, uh, Governor Mbeki and others. They are beginning to recognize that education is important. At that time, you also see other Africans going to the United States, Namdi Azikiwe of Nigeria, Zeke of Africa, to Lincoln College in the United States of America. Kwame Nkrumah is also going to school at that time. Mwalimu Nyerere is in Edinburgh. Kamuzu Banda is also in Edinburgh. People are going. Africa is beginning to see education as something that is important. Uh, James Kwejir Agri, Agri of Africa, who later became the first black deputy principal of Achimota College and a teacher of the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. They are taking all these individuals to Europe and America in the belief that these individuals will do their bidding but they do not know that they are planting a seed which is going to germinate in a totally different way and to give birth to an educational system which is going to revolutionize the continent of Africa. And you can see quite a number of Africans even when you go to the former French colonies, you see that wave of Leopold Sengo as I talked about, Felix Ufe in uh, you see Ahmed Ben Bella, Bibo Giba, all these are individuals check hunted up. All these individuals are going to that part of the world, but the colonizers do not for one moment believe that they are going to come back and be the agents of change and be the agents of revolution, revolution of education in the continent of Africa. And this is important because the spirit of Pan-Africanism is then being planted at that time, a series of meetings, as I've already indicated, are held in the Caribbean and ultimately culminating in the much more famous meeting in 1945 in Manchester in the United Kingdom, where you are some of the names that you can recognize are present in Manchester, where the spirit of Pan-Africanism, which is revivalism, of individuals who did not go to school want us to see education from a totally different perspective. You can see a little later people like uh, Marcus Garvey. No formal education, but they are influenced by this spirit of, of Pan-Africanism when he sings Garvey was a buffalo soldier in the heart of America. When you hear people like Fela Nikula Pokuti much later in Nigeria, Miriam Makeba from, from, from uh, Southern Africa. You can see the arts are being influenced by these. And ultimately, when we talk about Pan-Africanism 1945, you begin to see a people who know that in order for Africa to realize her potential, her people must begin to work together. And it's instructive. You see people like Walter Rodney, from Guyana, these are academics, Aime Sesua, from Martinique, and you can see the writing at that time. After 1945, we then begin to see the agitation, both from the political front and across the continent. Kwame Nkrumah, Yosagiev, is in my view the high priest of it all. He sees it differently. Julius Nyerere sees it differently. Magai of Sierra Leone, Tubman, Ahmed Ben Bella, and one can go on and on. They are saying there is something that unites us as Africans 
And that thing is what must inform everything we do, leading to the very famous statement by the Osage for himself, you are not an African because you are born in Africa, but you are an African because Africa is born in you. So that you can see the clarity and the purity of thought processes at that time. But the neo-colonial Europe is not resting. In former French colonies, what have they done? Félix Houphé Boigny is the deputy in the French parliament. Leopold Sédar Senghor is a deputy in the French parliament. And what they do, and excuse me, for the French, they also, also gave you a wife to ensure that you are under very close marking at all quarters. <laughs> so you can see that your education beyond the Sorbonne, you are also educated at home. So, and, and all these things with the help of Einstein, they are very deliberate. They are very deliberate. And you can see that they are doing that because they want to ensure that even after you have left their country, they are still in control of their processes through you. In the United States of America, a debate now rages the Taliaferro Washington approach, where you conform without transforming, and the W.E.B. Du Bois approach, where you transform education. And remember, W.E.B. Du Bois is the person who then, I think he earned the first PhD, African American, to earn a PhD at the University of Harvard. I think he's buried here in Ghana, W.E.B. Du Bois. And another man emerges from the United States, Carter G. Woodson in 1933, is involved in the education system and he writes a book, The Miseducation of the Negro. He has now looked at the education system and he's asking, what history are you teaching to young Africans? What geography are you teaching to young Africans? What Chemistry are you teaching to young Africans? He's interrogating education at all levels because he knows that education is the key via which you can gain genuine transformation. Carter G. Woodson writes that book. But in 1933, outside of the United States of America, outside of the Caribbean, into the continent of Africa, we are already beginning to see agitation to regain independence, to become masters of our own affairs. It starts very early through various movements which are led by unschooled people, unschooled in the, from the Western perspective. Agitation about land rights, because these are going to become important later even at the university. The Mau Mau movement, in Kenya, the Hehe Rebellion, in Uganda in the 1990s, Omuka Makabarega of the Bunyoro Kitara Empire. Here in West Africa, we see the resistance in, in, in Benin, and we see the resistance among the Yoruba people, the Temne and the Mende in Sierra Leone. So there is activity across the continent culminating in the formation of political organization paradoxically and ironically by the people who are trained in Europe and whom they thought would be their agents, giving meaning to what is written by Kenya's Ngugi Wath Yongo in his book, The River Between, when he instructs his chief character, Waiyaki, go unto the white man and learn what he teaches you, but come back and do the right thing. You can see that the impact is also in the literature of it. So when you look at, when you look at the, the books that are being written at that time in the 1950s, whether it is Chinua who is writing, whether it's Sembene Ortsman who is writing, whether it's Peter Abrahams who is writing, whether it's Alan Patton cry, is, who is writing, you can see there is something about the writing at, at, at that time which is informing how you are going to organize yourselves. 
And when Krumah comes back to Ghana, invited by the UGCC, he finds a few conservatives, because they'll always be such, who think that the slave master's house is fine. Just make it a little better. And as one wise man said, one of the greatest danger, the most dangerous things is to have a happy slave. <laughs> and as Al Malcolm X puts in his analogy of the house Negro and the field Negro, he says, the house Negro, when the master's house is burning, he says, our house is burning. But the field Negro says, let it burn down. So you can see, even within the educated class, the quality of education has affected people differently. And those of you who are Ghanaians now know when uh, Kwame writes his book, Dark Days in Ghana, when he is exiled in, in Conakry, and he talks about why the CPP was where he created his own political party, you can begin to see the urgency of the moment. And it's not only happening there. It is happening in different parts of the world. To me in Africa. In the former French colonies, you can see the appetite now through the pan-African spirit to do something to change. We fight and regain independence. And it's never lost on me that it's those who are Western educated of whatever kind who are in the forefront of the struggle for independence. In South Africa, as I've already said, it starts with Kaisa Kaseme, it starts with Lutuli. The other ones take it over, Nelson Mandela, and, and people like Mbeki a little later take it over. You go to, uh, you go to uh, Swapo in uh, Namibia, the ones who take it are Yasam Nuyoma, Andimba, Haman, Toivo, Ya Toivo. You go to Mozambique, it is uh, Mondlane and Samora. You go to Malawi, it is Kamuzu. You go to Zambia, it is Kaunda and Kapwepwe. You go to Angola, it is Neto, Savimbi and Roberto. You come to Kenya, it is Jomo, Oginga and Thomas Joseph Mboya. And the agenda is loaded. Kwame is clear. But it must always be remembered that people meet in Addis Ababa when Africa is split into two ideologically on all things. The Monrovia group led by William Tubman, including Felix Hufe Bwanyi, including Leopold Sedar Senghor, hold the view that we should slow things down. The Casablanca group led by Kwame Nkrumah, Modibo Keita, Ahmed Ben Bella, Gamal, Abdel Nasser, say we must change things now. So they meet in Addis Ababa as the Monrovia group and the Casablanca group. Ultimately, the OAU is a creation and a triumph for the Monrovia group. So Africa creates a weak organization. And I say this because ultimately when you look at the institutions that are then formed even on education, they begin to germinate from Addis Ababa. So we go back and we start now to struggle for independence for the countries that have not regained independence. The Freedom Fighting Office is opened in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania to focus on apartheid South Africa and, and, and Ian Smith's Rhodesia and Southwest Africa and other countries that have not regained independence. But now, the countries, the new countries are faced with reality. You go to some of the countries, you only have one graduate or 10. And I want you to look at each one of those countries. Look at Rwanda, Urundi. There were no more than 10 graduates. Look at Kenya. There were no more than 500 graduates. And you can go on and on. You have a crisis of governance. In fact, the French countries are worse. Guinea Conakry, I forgot to mention Ahmed Sekou Touré. 
When the French are leaving after the yes-no vote in 1958, they destroy everything in Algeria. They destroy everything in Guinea-Conakry. They destroy everything in Mali, then the Sudan. They destroy everything. Now, how do you govern? How do you have universities when there are no lecturers? How do you run your hostel facilities? How do you deal with agriculture? You've inherited institutions where there is not possibly a single African professor. How do you do this? The crisis of education now comes in and you have to go into quick training. And that is where, and I'm jumping this, where the airlifts now come in. The airlifts are happening in different parts of the world. Ghana, you are now on a crash program taking young people to the United States of America, taking people to the United Kingdom in Ruskin College, taking people later, of course, to the Patrice Emery Lumumba University in, in Moscow because there is also a competition there. The Soviet Union, because it is now also a struggle for the, the neo-colonial project, is now alive. So in Kenya, they have what is fundamentally the Kennedy airlift. The Kennedy airlift in Kenya is initiated, actually. Kenyans don't actually accept, but this is the reality. The Kennedy airlift is attributed to Thomas Joseph Mboya, but it was a Gikonyo Kiano who, having earned his PhD in the United States, who came with the idea. And then they take 800 people to become the civil servants. On the other hand, the Soviet Union is also taking people to Hungary, East Germany, and the Soviet Union. There is a crash of people who then come back to become pioneer educationists. And you see it in Tanzania, you see it in different ways. And I say that, that we may understand the Pan-African component of education and the ever-present hand of the near colonizer in the entire arrangement. So those of you who went to the Soviet Union, you come in, once again, you always went there and they came with Russian, uh, uh, Russian girls who were uh, watching them very closely. And, and if you look very closely, out of 10, seven were married to, to Russian girls or East German girls. Those who go to the United States, uh, and, and for the ladies, of course, you are a little bit more discreet, so you never came with the men. But for, for the men, you find they come up either with the Caucasian or African-Americans. But, but you can see the process of indoctrination is alive and well. So when they come back, they begin to populate our universities. And the universities are organized in a manner, as I said a little earlier, the East African University in Dar es Salaam, or rather in, in Kenya and Tanzania and, and, and Uganda, you now have specialty. It's called the University of East Africa. That is what we inherit. How do we deal with the University of East Africa? They were specialized. And I said a little earlier, some countries don't have a university at all. You are in Rodi, you are in Nyasaland, you are in Zambia. You begin to create universities. You create the University of Zambia. You are in Rwanda, Urundi. You create a university. You find yourself in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which immediately after 1961, there is a problem. How do you create a university? You are Dauda Kairaba Jawara in Gambia. You create a university. The only place you can go to is in Dhaka, Senegal. You are in La Côte d'Ivoire. You are in all those countries. How do you create the university and who runs them? And many of you will remember that the first vice chancellors were foreigners for good reason. Some of you are here, you are there at that time, either as graduate assistants or tutorial fellows. Which books are you reading? Are they Pan-African books? Are these Pan-Africanism still alive and well at that time? Because Pan-Africanism also demands, among other things, that the training is directed in a particular way. 
and you can see major activity. The Ghanaians will know when the Osage folk comes is in a hurry. We better. We never rather. Education is given his pride of place. When in 1969 he's instituting the Kwame Nkrumah University Institute, which is now the Kwame Nkrumah University. And I want you to read his speech on that day about university education. He is telling Ghanaians, Ghana needs a new kind of man who thinks differently. And he is active across the continent of Africa. He says, we do a kosombodam because we want engineers, we want electricity. He is telling Tubman in Liberia, don't sell your rubber. We tell Firestone, tires must be made here, therefore we need engineers. Train doctors here. That is the Osagi effort. Pan-Africanist to the hilt. Nyerere, being interviewed in 1967 about education, he says, the education system I've inherited here treats and creates an African man or woman whose greatest desire is to run away from his Africanness. We must change that. We must create an African who is educated and whose true north is the love for Africa. And you can see it in, in, uh, in Senegal, much more sentimentally and romantically rather than practically, Leopold Sedar Sengo comes with the Negritude movement. And the Negritude movement has been criticized by some people. Like, I know Wales Shoinka did not like it. But this is the genesis. Those of you who are students of history and philosophy will have heard of René Descartes, who says, Dubito ego cogito, cogito ego sum. I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am. And then Negritude says, I dance, therefore I am. And Wale said, this man is simply saying that our business as African is to dance. <laughs> and, 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 and you can remember the history of the Negritude movement and the Festival for Arts in 1966 in Dhaka, Senegal, and the subsequent one in Surulere Stadium in 1977, Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa Square, about festi festac, celebrating art. Senghor responds by saying, I'm saying education must be complete. Maths, chemistry, biology, philosophy. But we must not forget the arts and the humanities. And is reinforced in this by Chuck Antadiop, for whom a university now exists in Senegal, and a philosophy of Diopism exists. You can now begin to see that there is, uh, uh, there is this sometimes rising, sometimes ebbing away of the desire to create an education system that is going to address our needs. Africa is in a hurry. You made promises when you are struggling for independence that life will change. But where are the teachers to teach at your primary school? Where are the doctors to treat people? Where are the agriculture extension officers to make sure that agriculture works? Where are they? So what do you do? Many universities find themselves in crash programs. Education without philosophy. Education for acquisition of skills without more. And you can now begin to see all universities in Africa are essentially offering degrees that are not homegrown. Even our own high school examinations are not homegrown. It's Cambridge University, which is setting our education system for all level and A level. Our universities are linked. If it is the University of Ibadan, is offering the degrees of the University of London. Nairobi is offering the degrees of the University of London. The University in Angola is offering the degrees of Lisbon. There is an affiliation between the University in Abidjan and so on. Because you don't have the capacity. 
And I'm saying this, how does this affect the Pan-African project? Many of you will remember an experiment that was undertaken in biology by a Russian called Pavlov. You remember that, conditional reflex. So the more you do it, the more it becomes natural to you. The more you got into these spaces, the more in your default moments you think in the manner in which you are conditioned. And I'm saying this, that our training then has a complete impact and indeed affects our world view and our training. So that if I now begin to go into the last segment of my conversation, you are now talking about different things in, in different professions. Let's take the legal profession, for example. What is Pan-Africanist about the legal profession? There are three streams of legal profession that you see in Africa. There is the continental civil law system, which is unique to the French system, has elements of it in the former Portuguese colonies, the single former Spanish colony called Napoleon, derived from that tradition. That is the civil law system. And we say gleefully, we now are in our legal system independent, complete with how they dress, like Father Christmas. <laughs> then you have the common law system, which is derived from the law, the reception day, 12th of August, 1897, when we received the common law, and we are very happy about it. And even in Ghana, you can still see how your judges dress, Father Christmas and now Mother Christmas, <laughs> complete with our speakers. Common law. Then when you go south, the other tradition is Dutch Roman. So what is Pan-African about all these? Nothing Pan-African about all these. And we say that African customary law is only applicable to the extent that it is not repugnant to justice and morality. Whose morality we do not say, but we know. So you can see how that kind of training does not allow you to have a pan-Africanist view and a pan-Africanist concept of justice. When we come to land tenure systems, here in Ghana, for example, you had land tenure systems in the different communities. You are now being told that we have imported a system of land tenure system from Torrent system in Australia to be applied here. You can now begin to see, and I say this because it is contemporary, even as I speak. I remember a case that was tried in Tanzania by a West African, I think he's Guyanese, Telford Georges, he was then the Chief Justice of, uh, of, of Tanzania immediately after independence, and a Tanzanian man was charged with the offense of bigamy. And the offense, of course, when you are found guilty, you are then jailed because the law said that marriage is the union of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. But then, Telford George said, but in traditional African societies, marriage is the union of one man and all women. <laughs> so he was saying that the, 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 the mores of the society is different. So why do you criminalize? That was his argument. And you can see that these are extant issues about Pan-Africanism. How do you deal with people in that regard? And the most recent, those of you who come from Rwanda during the post-genocide, the gachacha. The gachacha jurisprudence is rich. How many people are rehabilitated through gachacha? Hundreds of thousands. How many people has the Rwanda tribunal in Arusha tried? Not more than 10. And recently, Felician Kabuga has no responsibility. Another one is arrested. How many years since the genocide? Can they go back into their societies? They cannot go back. Those who came to the Gashasha, are they back in communities? Yes. Pan-African. Is it homogeneous? No. It is unique. What is applicable amongst the Asante is not necessarily so amongst the Zulu. Unity in diversity. That is in the area of law. Medicine. Recently, what are we teaching 
in our medical schools. Is there something Pan-African about it? No. The greatest claim to fame of an African doctor is that I went to the London School of Tropical Medicine. And when they say it, they shake their head. <laughs> is there anything wrong with it? But I am urging you, if you ever want to get sick in Europe, don't have malaria. Choose another disease. <laughs> because you then become a medical curiosity. They don't know how to deal with it. I don't, I'm sure some of you have found themselves in such a space. They don't. But are we undertaking research here? Right now in Africa, the greatest, the most famous research that is going on on malaria vaccine is by the University of Oxford. They are funding it. It is we who should be funding that because it is something that is common to us. Herbal medicine. Have we mainstreamed herbal medicine? No. Last year, you know, a number of children died out of cough syrup in, in Gambia. Many of them out of some medicine, cough syrup medicine that was made in India. And the government of the Gambia has now hired an American law firm to represent them. I'm still talking about Pan-Africanism. <laughs> so you can see, and recently during COVID, you could see when... The Malagasy Institute of Applied Science came up with a medication, COVID organic. How many ordered it? Only two countries. Three, I think. John Joseph Magufuli in Tanzania, Equatorial Guinea, and I think Ghana doubled with it. But we have more faith in AstraZeneca, Moderna, Sputnik, and I asked at one time, does the Bureau of Standardization in any of our African countries have a standard for those vaccines? No. And why have you all been vaccinated? By faith. <laughs> By faith. Because you don't know. So you can see that, but herbal medicine, and I'm saying this because this is Pan-Africanist. You go to India and look at Ayurveda, mainstreamed. They have mainstreamed their own medication. And people now go to health farms in India and in Kerala. You go to China, they have mainstreamed their own medication. But you talk about African medicine, you say, ah, yeah, yeah, that was a, a witch doctors. Of, our African doctors are witch doctors. <laughs> Black magic. So I'm saying, why are we not teaching this? Go into engineering. Right now, in every African country, what you see are Chinese. We have been producing engineers in the thousands. But what do you see? Which begs the question, what are we teaching in our engineering schools? What about environment? Is there a Pan-Africanist element in, in that regard? Look at the plastic pollution. Look at our own contribution to the COP and climate change. The desertification arrest which we tried, and I think Senegal has done the best in terms of trying to arrest desertification. One can go on and on, but I want to conclude. What I'm saying, therefore, is we must decolonize our education system. And the decolonization of our education system means that we must revolutionize our curriculum. And when we look at our curriculum, we must ask ourselves what it is that we teach at our universities in, at all levels, whether it is in the sciences or in the humanities. It saddens me, and I know that knowledge has no geographical boundary. That I know. But I know that knowledge must also be localized in order to respond to the realities of a particular environment. If you go to the Scandinavians now, the Finnish model of education is praised. Who teaches in the kindergarten in Scandinavian countries? PhDs. Who teaches in our kindergartens? I'm not going to say who they are out of respect. 
But if the foundation is weak, then what are you doing? Our, some of our very best should teach at the foundational level. And I'm going to say that is how you begin to infuse this Pan-African concept in our entire discourse. You go to Scandinavia, see how they teach chemistry. The history of chemistry. The history of biology. The history of mathematics. So that when a child is saying, what is a zero? When did zero acquire value in the history of mathematics? They know. And all these can only be done by revamping our curriculum. And if that is done, it is you who are here, you men and women who are here, who are leading institutions that must begin to think about it and think about it very seriously. And I'm happy that Ashesi University is in that space and is therefore catalyzing the entire process of re-examining. Because Africa is now in a, in a crisis, one may say, if you want to be uh, negative about it, but I think it is on the cusp of something. We are at, a, at crossroads. It's a question of where we choose to go. Because crisis is the mother of invention and innovation throughout history. And if that be true, what is it that we can do in the context of Pan-Africanism? We are talking about Pan-Africanism, but Africa is now saying that there are things that we must do. We started saying this in 1908 with the Lagos Plan of Action and said Africa is going to trade to ensure that we increase trade up to 50%. We never did much with African continental free trade. We started saying that we must have African things in the sector of aviation. In 1988, we came with the Yamasukuru Declaration. In agriculture, we came up with the Malabo Declaration. We came up with the uh, Declaration on Health in Aju Abuja in 2001. On women, we came up with the Maputo Declaration. All these now must be taught at the universities. They are not being taught. Are we teaching Africa Agenda 2063 at any university on a serious note, or we just mention it fleetingly? Those of you who are in the departments of economics, are you teaching Africa continental free trade area, and are you looking at the tariff and non-tariff barriers here in ECOWAS? In SADAC, are you looking at them? In East African community, are we looking at them? In Central Africa, are we looking at them? In the Maghreb, are we looking at them? And I'm suggesting that it is only through a pan-African approach. In other words, telling us that there is something unique about the manner in which you do things. And there is something that is happening of a young man from the Gambia who got a scholarship to go to the United States and he chose to go to the university in Rwanda and I loved it. Because the Rwandese may be small, but there, there are certain things that they are getting right. Right now in Mauritius, Mauritius is a small country but is becoming the focal point in terms of financials. Are we teaching that? Which books are we reading? in our universities for, on economics. Are we reading Dambisa Moyo? Or we are reading, reading Michael Todaro? In other words, we must begin to think differently. And I am saying that we must think like Kwame did. And his stalwarts. That the time is now for us to realize that higher education is what is going to liberate Africa. And is only going to liberate Africa if we teach the right things. And is only going to liberate Africa if we implement the right things. And that is why I understand James Eman Kwejir Agri, Agri of Africa, who one day at a class, he came. And I paraphrase and told his audience that one time a farmer, a naturalist, was walking in the forest and he picked the young of an eagle and took it home. When he had taken it home, he kept it with his chicken and fed it on chicken feed for a long time. One day, 
Somebody came, a naturalist came to the farm and said, amongst your chicks, there is an eagle. And the farmer said, I know. It's an eagle, but we have kept it here and fed it on chicken feed for a very long time. It is no longer an eagle. It is chicken. And the naturalist said, no. Once you are an eagle, you are always an eagle. Let us try and see if it has some eaglehood remaining in it. And he put it on the palm of his hands and urged it to fly and it refused to fly. And the farmer said, I told you. It was once an eagle, but it's no longer an eagle. We have fed it on chicken feed for too long. The naturalist came again and said, no, it is an eagle. So he put it on the palm of his hand facing the sun and it flew and flew and he looked at the farmer and said, no matter how long you feed an eagle on chicken feed, its eaglehood doesn't die. It may remember to come back to the chicken, but it is always an eagle. Africa is in that space. Let us be the eagle that James Emmons Kweji Agri talked about. Thank you. Um, very thought-provoking historical articulation of the disjuncture between education and the ideals of pan Afghanism. So I would permit three questions. My name is Peter Bankole uh, from Pan Atlantic University. How can we decolonize education when all we look forward to uh, is accrediting our universities according to Western standards? And even our regulators are equally trained in the Western traditions. And the students that we train are also looking forward to integrating to the Western world. How do we, as educators, solve that? Thank you very much. I can only share my thoughts without being prescriptive. Because you are seasoned educators in your own right. And I'm quite certain, and, and I know quite a number of you yeah, who, whom I work with, who, who are sound educators, and all of you are. The problem we have in Africa is the disconnect between the professional and the policymaker and the quality of politics on critical things. And I think my own view is that we must keep on trying. Sometimes we judge ourselves too quickly and too harshly. Because if you look at the history of many African countries, some are very young in, in terms of trying to, to, uh, to domesticate, if you may. And I'm using the word domesticate very guardedly because there is a sense in which certain areas and certain, uh, 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 certain knowledge is universal. The laws of physics don't change because you are in Africa. But there is a sense in which when you implement physics, they can be applied to address specific issues. So when we are talking about decolonization, we are talking about the sensitivity of curricular articulation and implementation to the realities on the ground. Take, for example, agriculture. We now know that Africa is losing her seeds. In the area of agriculture, we don't control what we eat. And we know that there is a conspiracy through monopolies such as Syngenta and, 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 and Monsanto. And they are present in Africa. You have the one acre fund. They are everywhere. They are to be found everywhere. Can't we, when we are crediting our faculties of agriculture, make demands of them? That one of the things that we are not going to do is to allow genetic manipulation in a particular direction. The Russians are doing it. The Chinese are doing it to a certain extent. The Vietnamese are doing it. So that if you go to a faculty of agriculture and our research institutes, they are also informed by that reality. Right now, you know, for example, in agriculture, Norway has the largest storage or concentration of seeds in the world. As I speak now, in the next two years, China is going to overtake, is going to overtake Ghana, Togo, and La Côte d'Ivoire in coffee production. Fact. 
I think Malaysia has already overtaken Nigeria. So I'm saying that in those specific areas, it is you, the academics. You are vice chancellors. Why do you sometimes sell yourselves short? Keep on making noise. Keep on making noise. Don't surrender. Don't think, don't think that you have not achieved them. It's chipping it slowly by slowly. And I think that regulators, and there are regulators here, who in that specific area of agriculture, you can now begin to inform. Look at the area of management. It, there is nothing that, that annoys me most. I don't know whether there are accountants here. If there are accountants here, you hear at the end of every meeting that we have read your books. They are now conform with universal standards. Who's universal standards? <laughs> Why can't we have, when we are looking at specifics, that they are African standards with certain standards which are peculiar to Ghana, even when we talk about universality, because business is different. But African governments have their books of accounts being examined by Price, Cooper, and Waterhouse, Deloitte, and Tush, Ernest, and Young. Not Boateng and Boateng. <laughs> if Boateng and Boateng formed an accountancy firm, they will get no work. Immediately they go to Ernest and Young, they get work. Low self-esteem. So in a nutshell, Professor, what I'm saying is that this is work in progress. And I think that something is beginning to happen even in, 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 in East Africa and can now see people are coming together through research institutions. And what we must do is to finance this thing. Part of our problem is financing. You remember, for example, in the health sector, in 2001 in Abuja, African countries say, we are going to spend at least 5% of our budgets, not GDP, budget, in financing health. Which countries ever did it? Rwanda and Mauritius and Botswana at 3%. The rest, they don't even pay. So how are academics going to engage in research? In many of your universities now, I was talking to a Nigerian professor just after the Asut strikes, for example. They lost 600 medical personnel. 600. As Freshly baked graduates going into Australia and Canada after you trained them, they just walk into the theater there and begin work. Meanwhile, maternal mortality is alive and well. All the diseases that we thought we had eliminated are coming back. So, Professor, I think it's not going to be easy because, number one, because of the quality of politicians we elect. Yeah, that is our problem is actually that. I was listening yesterday to, no, just this morning, to a Chinese official. And I know I said we can never catch up. The man is talking about the games, that the Asian games that I think are commencing next week. There are 44 facilities. And they are thinking how those facilities are going to be utilized after the games are over. And they are thinking about linking them to institutions for sustainability. I want you for two seconds to think about home, own African country. What do we do with them? What do we do with those facilities? Zero. Very few, except in South Africa. In certain areas, South Africa tries to do a good job. Mauritius tries to do a good job. A few African countries. Rwanda is doing a very good job with their basketball. Uh, their basketball uh, pitch which they are now using so there is a sense so it is not is not all gloom and doom you know sometimes we don't give positive examples those of you who are from south africa for example will remember that 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 south african institutions are the ones that are doing better than everybody else because they had a farm foundation and and there is something i forgot to mention I'm overextending my answer, but education is so important. How many of you remember, for example, the 1976 Soweto massacres? It was about education. How do you train people? In what language? The Cameroon massacres about the use of English and the use of French. So it can be done, Professor. And I now, as I grow older, 
In my younger days, I used to misguide myself that uh, everything would happen in my lifetime. I now know better. <laughs> I now know that mine is to play my part. And once you play your part, then that is the best you can do. And the other thing we must do as Africans is to document. We don't document things. So that your good ideas, they just disappear. But these fellows, these other civilizations, what they have done very well is documentation, document. The mortality rate of journals in African universities is without comparison. If a journal survives for three years, then you hold a party. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pielo Lumumba. And uh, the lecture was uh, very scintillating and good. My name is uh, Professor Washington Okeo, and from the Management University of Africa in uh, Kenya. And uh, Professor Pielo is not uh, new to me, neither am I new to him, because uh, he is a member of uh, the University Governing Council of my university, and I'm very proud. So, Prof, when I hear you spewing, <laughs> unfortunately, this kind of, you know, uh, information that is giving, I only see them in video clips. <laughs> I never get to see them live. So, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate uh, to now hear them live, uh, at least from, uh, you know, the very man himself. But, Prof, you've done a good job of giving us uh, the history of Pan-Africanism and the problems that... Um, you know, the Pan-Africanism has uh, faced in the past. I'm just wondering that with, with the current uh, state uh, of things that we are in, in terms of uh, we being, uh, and particularly our kids and grandchildren, being exposed to the very wild, worldly things in the Western world, in the Eastern world, and so on, and to the extent that what we are practicing is not really African in the real sense. And it doesn't help that there has been a lot of migration from the rural settings where real African traditions and cultures are actually practiced and, uh, and observed to the urban centers where um, children are exposed to a lot of you know, foreign stuff, the Western style of life, the Eastern style of life, and so on and so forth. So where does that leave the future of Pan-Africanism? I think I, I, if you can highlight a little bit of the future yes. of Pan-Africanism in, in this context, I think it would be interesting to, to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll give a, a very short story, which is taken from Hindu tradition. A young man who was a monk and had lived in a completely male society went to a guru and said, I have lived my life and I have decided to be celibate. And the guru told him, in order to make that decision, you must be released into the whole world, into the real world for one year. Then after that, you can come and tell me whether that is the path that you have chosen. So he went, and those of you who understand Hindu stories, they are, they are uh, gurus and they are sannyasi and sannyasins. So he went and for the first time met a girl, and he came back to the guru and said, I met another person, and when I greeted her, my body was abnormal. Then the guru said, go out and understand who she is. He came back after one year, he told the guru, I do not want to be celibate. <laughs> and to me, armchair pan-Africanism without being tested is not pan-Africanism. And pan-Africanism is not about romanticizing things that are fossilized in the past. Pan-Africanism cannot be the things we used to do. 
Pan-Africanism must be the things that we do which are informed by our reality and informed by interaction through other civilizations. There are beautiful things that I see from India. I will want them to be incorporated. Look at the whole idea of what we now call Ubuntu. Ubuntu is, we now say it is African, but it's from the Isi Zulu and, and Isi Zulu and Isi Kos. But we find something, you can find something that is unique to you. So I'm never worried. The only thing is as long as you have your true north, you know that this is for the benefit of Africa and you are agile enough. In my other life, I'm a martial artist. And one of my, my teachers in terms of his martial art philosophy is Bruce Lee and his system of Tao uh, Jire Kunedu. At one time, he's asked, if you want to be a good fighter, what must you be? He said, you must be fluid. A good fighter must be fluid, must not be rigid. It must be like water. When water gets into a cup, it takes the shape of the cup. When it gets into a bottle, it takes the shape of the bottle. It can be solid, it can be gas, but it's still water. And to me, that is what Pan-Africanism is all about. So what we must tell our young men and women is that wherever they are, they must try to live to certain ideals. And I think in many ways, when you carry yourself with dignity and humility, then your Pan-Africanism is like the piano, the black and the white creates a symphony. And those of you who are from South Africa must remember a man called Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. Sobukwe said in 1960s before the Sharpeville massacre, when there was the apartheid regime was at his side, he said, there is only one race, the human race. And I agree, but with different shades. And Pan-Africanism, therefore, can be infused. You are a child. One of the things that I encourage people, if you have a tongue, which we call mother tongue, history has now demonstrated that you speak other tongues better when you have mastered your mother tongue. There was a situation in Africa, particularly among the middle class, when it was status symbol. When you tell your colleagues, when you are Muganda, you know, my child does not speak Luganda. He only speaks English. <laughs> As, and I'm sure in French, the same thing. So we must have that pride. Have you ever wondered, for example, why the Chinese are bringing Confucius? There is not a university, perhaps not here, but there is not a major university in Africa today where there is no Confucius center. Why are they doing it? Because culture, cultural dominance, and we are taking it. Do we have Pan-African institutes, universities, where you are teaching? They are, they are beginning, they are starting to teach Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa at the university, at the Friendship University in Russia from next year. Are we teaching Yoruba in our universities? Are we teaching Hausa? So in a nutshell, Professor, what I'm saying is that we must define what Pan-Africanism is, and it must not mean, you know, one of the things that I find very annoying is that when uh, an American one, these foreign uh, heads of state are visiting our countries, then we parade young boys and young girls in Saiso and say that is our culture. Our culture must have changed unless we simply want to demonstrate this is what we used to do. But it doesn't mean that that is what we are doing now. Things have changed. So I hold the view that there is discourse for Pan-Africanism, right now, through my own little foundation, we are beginning to found uh, Pan-African institutes. We are founding one in Eden University in Zambia. We are founding one in Lukenya University in Kenya and the University, uh, Unity University in Hargeisa. And we are saying we want to define, we don't want to romanticize Pan-Africanism. We want to give it practical meaning. Will we make mistakes? Yes, we will. Will we be corrected? Yes, we will. A hundred years from today, today, will it be richer? Yes, it will be. The Confucius that the Chinese are talking about, how many years did he live? Many years ago. So I hold the view that that is what we must do. Today, as I conclude answering your question, the whole idea of public lectures is dead in many universities. I remember at one time at the University of Nairobi when I was still teaching, 
I invited from Uganda one of the best constitutional legal minds in Africa, George, Professor George Kanyaihamba, to come and deliver a lecture. I had to go to classes to beg students to come and listen to him. <laughs> to beg. And it happened to me again at the University of Nairobi when Wale Shoinka was at the university. I had to go running from class. I say, we'll give sodas. <laughs> Which is what they used to give us when you are donating blood, you remember. <laughs> Can you believe it? But you go and you are, you yourself are university administrators. The whole idea of public lecture is about public discourse because an academic must know that we can disagree is, is a competition of ideas. If your idea is superior, it prevails and, 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 and we disagree in an agreeable manner. Today, because we have lost the culture of debate, if you hold a different opinion, you become my enemy. Even in the academic field, you find somebody, you come in the morning at the university, you greet Professor Mugendi. Is the man is not replying. <laughs> Why? Because we had a discourse. He says, and you ashamed me in public. <laughs> how, how can an academic be ashamed? Because the idea that I hold today may be proved wrong the following day. <laughs> so I think, Professor, that uh, that is what we must do. And the, the rot, and you know these things, many of you, the rot is actually up to this level. I was talking at, uh, somebody's from Strathmore University here. We were holding a, a discussion about artificial intelligence at, uni at, at Strathmore University. And I said this, I said I'm a disruptive thinker. And I said, okay, you are IT experts. Who's IT? You are spanner boys and spanner girls for Google. Yeah, because you are not in control of the technology. So you may be doing things, you have said, oh, cloud, cloud, cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Who's cloud? Are you in control of the cloud? Today we are all on web, uh, website, website. Who's website? Who is controlling that website? A church here can be turned off like this. So... In order, and this is the pan-Africanism that I'm talking about, let us appropriate that technology and begin to control it from Accra. The Chinese have done that. Weibo, TikTok. But we have not. We are still gleefully Google. You're Google. Cloud. You can be switched off like this. My Twitter account. That's not your Twitter account. Elon Musk sitting in Seattle can do it like this and you're finished. <laughs> but what our IT at the university, I want to hear that there is a collaboration. Because right now, Professor, you know, within East Africa, we have university, you vice chancellors meet, both in Kenya and in East Africa. In West Africa, it's the same. I want to hear that one of the things you are talking about now is IT. Because we are going into the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, and we are talking artificial intelligence. But are we in control? Are we in control of the drone technology? We are just consumers without being in control. And curiously, I look at what is happening. China, for whatever it is worth, the only media that I watch, I watch <laughs> faithfully, is CGTN and CNC to just understand Within 30 years, these fellows have done marvel. You know, in my ethnic group, some people come from my ethnic group. If you had a shirt called Japan, Japan, not no, Japan, which was Japan, it, it was the cheapest quality from Japan. Then if I said, ah, your shirt is Korea, it means it was from Korea. That is in the textile industry. When I was alive. There was a time when the radio that we used and knew was Grundig. Today, tell me where there is Grundig. Nokia came, Samsung came. Look at what the Koreans have done. Look at what the Vietnamese. Vietnam by next year is going to produce more coffee than Kenya and Uganda combined. Vietnam. I tell people sometimes morbidly, look at your undergarments. They are made in Vietnam. And when you go to eat today, look at your toothpicks. So, 
This is particularly, as I conclude answering that question, is in this area of artificial technology, really we must take charge. If we don't take charge, because there's no going back, the only question, who is in control? The, the, the Indians now are amazing. You go to India and you see what is happening at Indian University, both in that sector, because technology is controlling everything. It is medical sector, it is agriculture. Look at the patents that are being issued in Israel, little Israel. Israel registers more patents than all African countries combined, little Israel. Israel is smaller than greater Accra. Last question you said. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Toto. Thank you so much, Professor Lumumba. We have so much, so many more questions. Um, and um, I think we have been inspired. We've been, uh, um, I want to use the word triggered, to think you know, more deeply about how we are looking at the continent. Um, and one of the things for me, personally, is just that deep longing to contribute and continue to love the continent. And sometimes it might feel as if the, the, the movements we make are so small, <laughs> but you know, little movements, little drops of water across multiple institutions in tiny spaces on the continent, eventually will pull together, right? To move that boulder up the hill that we are pushing it to. So thank you very much, Professor. We are very, very grateful for your time.